The Fatui Harbingers are pretty evil. Much of their evil deeds are well documented. And yet they're not fully considered evil because of their ultimate goal, rebellion against the divine. The Fatui and the Abyss Order have just as much of a bone to pick with Celestia as we do. Even the other Archons are silently wary of them. But it's difficult to sit here and view the Fatui as a bunch of freedom-fighting revolutionary heroes. They've caused way too much suffering for us, the Traveler, to even think of allying with them. Yet many in the community believe, in the end, that we'll ally with the Fatui. The question is, how do we get from here to that point? How will our confrontation with the Tsaritsa play out? It's difficult to imagine we'd forgive her for all the harm that was done in her name, so how will she answer for these transgressions? I have a few explanations here, and it might be easier than you think. Before we continue, let's get the formalities out of the way. Nothing is guaranteed, none of what I say will necessarily come true, and this is a thought experiment for the sake of fun. You know, etc. I could also be very, very wrong. Alright, we done? Now let's start from the top. The Tsaritsa is an Archon, and by extension, she's pretty much almost guaranteed to be playable. And with that Archon playable status, comes some sort of relationship that she will develop with the Traveler, just like any other Archon. And so, the Tsaritsa has two major factors that could sway the Traveler over to her side. The first is her backstory. And the second is her personality, or just her overall character in general. But those secrets are for the writers to reveal, not me. But I think I can fill in for a third variable, circumstances. You ready for the theory? Alright, let's get into it. Let us cover the facts first. It will go a long way towards understanding what the Tsaritsa's predicament is. So, the Tsaritsa is one of the seven Archons, just like the rest. And in truth, an Archon individually has no more power to successfully overthrow the Divine Order than any other native creature to Tevat. Because even seasoned Archons like John Lee, Venti, and the heavily hinted Hydro Archon are cautious of their wrath. Look what happened to Orobashi. That snake god didn't stand a chance. He was forced into a humiliating suicide invasion of Inazuma to protect his people. The story of Orobashi is one of incredibly important plot significance, but the main takeaway for this video is that the gods of Tevat are powerless to resist Celestia. The Tsaritsa, like the other Archons, should understand that very well. Of course, today, the Tsaritsa is perhaps the most powerful of the seven Archons. Her top three Harbingers, according to Nahida, have power that even rivals the gods, which is absolutely insane. Now this next point is a bit more debatable, but... As things currently stand, the Tsaritsa is perhaps the only Archon of the Seven to have betrayed her aspect of virtue. Venti has always been about freedom, albeit with some hiccups along the way. Zhongli unwaveringly upholds his contracts no matter what, and Raiden merely had to redefine the meaning of eternity. Nahida upended the old ways of false wisdom, but the Tsaritsa, supposedly the god of love, has lost love for her people. It's possible she still believes in love out of principle, or that she might no longer be known as the god of love, but perhaps no other Archon's actions have betrayed her respective qualities as brazenly as the Tsaritsa has. To be fair, I do understand this is a gray area, and perhaps the ways of the Fatui could be of a twisted love. But even if this wasn't true, it still makes sense with what I'm about to say next. How do we tie all this information together? Here comes the speculative segment where I try to describe her predicament in a general sense. The Tsaritsa changed after the Cataclysm 500 years ago, but she alone did not have the power to rebel. If she tried to fight the Divines head-on, it would be a massive disaster that could spell the end of her nation. And when you're in a disadvantaged position against a superior power, you can't afford to be too picky about who your allies are. Here's a stark contrast to the God of Love. The Abyss Order are fueled by hate and their minds are filled with resentment and revenge, a direct opposite to the Tsaritsa perhaps. 
The Tsaritsa allied with a powerful individual, Piero, whom likely shares her goal of seizing authority from the gods. Since then, Piero is at the head of the Fatui Harbingers, perhaps the most powerful organization of individuals in Tevat, just under the seven archons themselves. Let's also not forget that the denizens of Tevat widely respect and revere the divine. So, where do you find more allies in a world that views Celestia so highly? The other Archons cannot ally with you, perhaps out of fear of Celestia's wrath. Powerful warriors, whom are respected and high profile, have been favored by the gods. There is a belief amongst most of Tevat, especially the Chosen Ones, that they are blessed and favored, trying to get them to betray their beliefs, which they had their entire life, would be utterly impossible. I'm not saying that people worship Celestia directly, but they do worship their local god because they are a higher being. So how could they bring themselves to oppose beings of an even higher caliber than that? It would break their hierarchical worldview, and so they cannot bring themselves to do that. You also cannot start spreading anti-Celestia ideology worldwide in hopes of recruiting people because that would be a potential sign of open rebellion. So then, who would be your most reliable allies in such a suffocating situation? It has to be the ones rejected, alienated, and left behind by the nations of Tevat. Dotare was exceptionally talented, but his works were considered sacrilege by the academia and so he was exiled. You gain a powerful ally as long as you overlook his cruel experiments. Pantalone was born in poverty and questioned why gods had so much control over every area of life. Turns out he was exceptionally talented, and now you have his loyalty. Tartaglia was cast into the abyss and became a battle-hungry warrior, but as long as you take care of his family and quench his thirst for battle, he'll be a reliable warrior who fights by your side. Scaramouche's entire life was defined by betrayal and abandonment. And although he wasn't completely loyal to the Harbingers, he probably recognized the Fatui's hatred for the Old World Order, and so their goals aligned. Senora lost her faith for the gods when her lover was claimed in a conflict in which the Animal Archon was absently asleep. She believed the gods failed her, and so became an easy pickup for the Fatui. There's more I can say, but I think I got the point across. Yes, I do believe that the Tsaritsa has her own personal brand of loyal followers, just like how Rex Lapis has the Adepti and how Barbados has the Four Winds, but it's not enough. Powerful allies who wholeheartedly believe in her cause to overthrow the Divine are incredibly difficult to come by, especially in a world where everyone seems to revere them. Only the outcasts of society those who have the resentment in their hearts to the world order and to the heavenly principles can see eye to eye with her. Perhaps this is where the Tsaritsa betrayed her name as the god of love. Her greatest allies are now those with no love left for the world they live in. What keeps them going now is perhaps pure hatred. These people are not the purest, nor are they necessarily innocent souls who didn't deserve to be cast aside, but they are powerful and they are quite loyal for the most part. And so because of this, it's difficult for the Tsaritsa to control these people moralistically. You can't afford to be picky and criticize someone like Dottore, lest you jeopardize their loyalty by the time rebellion strikes. Fortunately for her, she knows that she's still the supreme authority in the organization, so she has the final say on the final objectives. As long as she can secure the loyalty of the most powerful outcast she could find. And this is where I think the core issue of the Tsaritsa lies. If she tries to force all of the Harbingers to answer for their injustices, she risks losing that hard-earned loyalty in their eyes, as she'd be just another self-righteous idealistic god. She can't afford to take risks like that, which jeopardize her grand plan. She's not ready for re rebellion as of now, and so can't afford to judge any of her allies until she's in a position of power to do so. And so, for the final piece of the puzzle, how will this tie into the confrontation with the Traveler? What about the Gnosis? Backstory and philosophy aside, the Tsaritsa feels she'll be ready after she collects all seven Gnosis. 
And if she does end up bringing over the Traveler to her side, perhaps the greatest ally she could recruit, she will finally feel confident enough to launch her invasion. Perhaps we can show her a new path. She no longer has to betray her own sense of love in order to save her people. I wouldn't be surprised at this point if the Tsaritsa decides to purge the Fatui of war criminals and the such to reform her military force. Do you think she would have allowed Dottore to harm so many innocent people if she didn't feel like she needed his help in the first place? So I think in the end she'll atone for the crimes done in her name once she secured the seven Gnosis and the Traveler as an ally. She never wanted such suffering for her people. And this makes perfect sense considering what was said in the Tevat trailer. But now that her plan is complete, she doesn't have to allow it to continue anymore. So in conclusion, I don't believe that Tsaritsa is evil. I don't think she'll even try to justify the actions of her subordinates. I merely believe she is a victim of circumstances and saw no other way to organize a rebellion powerful enough through conventional methods that doesn't compromise her virtues. Unlike the other Archons, she showed that she was willing to make great sacrifices to fight a greater battle. The other Archons would never have dared, being content to rule their own little domains without any aspirations of a greater future. So this is how I believe her character could be developed to make it believable that the Traveler allies with her. It's obviously still missing a lot of context. I don't know how events like the Cataclysm tie in and what happened in her personal life so this is the best I can come up with, given the facts we have. Does anyone have any better suggestions? Or are there flaws in my speculations? Anyways, that's it for this one. I had a lot of fun making this video, and I hope to make many more like this in the future. So until then, see y'all next time.